Okay, okay, Dana, tell me about this new book that you co-wrote, The New Reform, Judaism, Challenges and Reflections. Um, well, it is um, it is a book about the state of the reform movement today and specifically about boundaries and borders and identity and uh, general theological orientation. Um, I... Uh, uh, um, I had a book out on the reform movement in 2003 called American Reform Judaism, and in that book I described a lot of the movement itself, you know, Eric Yaffe and the Union for Reform Judaism, and so in this book I avoid most of that. So it's about what does Reform Judaism believe, or what could it believe, or what does it believe, or what, or what doesn't it believe, and uh, the connection between beliefs and practices and uh, uh, and how that reflects in its values, and then who fits into the reform movement, who's a reform Jew, where the boundaries of reform uh, Judaism are, and um, and what could be the promise of reform Judaism if it takes certain steps that I am a strong advocate for. Let me uh, just for a moment switch away from the cognitive and tell me how do you feel about the state of Reform Judaism right now? Does it do you feel good about it? Do you feel pessimistic about it? How do you feel about the state of Reform Judaism today? Well, um, on objective criteria, I don't think we're doing very well, uh, so I'm very worried about it. Um, but uh, I think that when you, as you know, when you become committed to something, you become committed to something. And so whether it's doing well or not, you're kind of in for the long haul. And so uh, I'm, uh, I'm in for the long haul. So it, it's something I believe in uh, for specific reasons uh, because I, 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 I want to connect to my Judaism on one hand, but I want a scholarly Judaism that makes sense, that's believable, that's consistent with rational thought uh, on the other. And therefore, um, this was the form of Judaism that made sense to me and continues to make sense to me. What's the difference today between Reform Judaism and Conservative Judaism? Well, in, in, in my mind or in reality? <laughs> Either, but well, in my mind, they're completely different. Uh, Reform Judaism uh, is committed to scholarship and is completely non-halachic, um, and therefore we're taking you know certain religious concepts and applying them in a new way, um, and uh, uh, specifically uh, it. Um, it, it, cor it corrects or avoids two of the fatal intellectual problems that, that I, in my view, completely um, disqualifies orthodoxy as, as uh, valid and, and truth, uh, truth giving, which is the um, uh, acceptance of biblical studies and, and the development of the biblical text, which uh, orthodoxy, as you know, um, uh, argues is one. A text given in, in exactly or almost exactly the format that we have, and that is simply not sustainable. Um, and, um, and 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 other such intellectual uh, approaches, which uh, which I, I think are just really important uh, if we're going to if we're going to have a, a religion which is truthful, which stands up to rigorous analysis and the best of modern scholarship. Um, now, conservative Judaism, of which I am not an expert by any means, of course, is trying to hold on to the halachic uh, concept and is saying we are a halachic movement. We believe that halacha changes and can uh, adapt to circumstances, but we are a halachic movement. So that seems to me to be two very, very different, uh, very, very different things. Um, in practice, there's very little difference, and to an outsider, there appears to be almost no difference. Um, but um, uh, but I think that uh, if to anticipate a, a, a question you might ask, 
uh, that to, to merge the two would be catastrophic because it would require, you know, to whatever extent each of these movements has a belief structure, basically to to eliminate those belief structures in favor of one um, hodgepodge of of uh, beliefs. Um, because as, as many people say, well, it, it seems like basically the same thing in practice anyway. So what I'm arguing is exactly the reverse, that we, we clarify and intensify our, what makes Reform Judaism different, what it makes Reform Judaism unique, what in my view makes Reform Judaism, um, uh, vital and, and, and urgent and necessary rather than you know, further blur any such theological distinctions in the interests of just merging in and saving money. What percentage of Reformed Jews do you estimate are open to buying books on Reformed Judaism? Uh, a very small percentage, but, a, but enough to keep my publishers happy. Um, I mean, compared to other arcane uh, books... Uh, my books sell very well. Compared to the latest bestsellers, my books don't sell anything. So it's all a matter of perspective. But um, I find it like when I do scholar-in-residence uh, programs that um, there are uh, a few people who are really, really intense readers, and they really enjoy reading the book. And they will have bought it before my appearance, or they will buy it at my appearance, and they will read it. There are others who will buy the book as souvenirs, and so therefore I've started putting in photos in my last two books, including this one. Um, and they love that. They, they'll they come over to where the book stand is, and they'll leaf through it, and they'll look at the pictures, and we'll talk about some of the pictures, and then they'll buy the book, and I sign it. And they put it up on the wall, and they've got a signed autographed copy from the from the author who they've met. So, the, the, so that's a good thing too. Um, but, um, but, but I found, um, uh, I found that, uh, uh, most of the, uh, most of the people in the reform movement are not, are not big readers. Maybe in orthodoxy they're more, um, more willing to read, uh, um, books on orthodoxy. I don't know, but, um, it's hard. Uh, to get the leaders of the movement necessarily to, to read the book. I didn't know how much time you spend with Jewish blogs, but the overwhelming number of, uh, of Jewish blogs are orthodox. Like I can't think of many, uh, I can't think of any important reform Jewish bloggers. Am I am I missing something? No, I think um, there's a, there's one or two. Um, what was his name? Uh, there was a college student, uh, Wolanski, who did a, a, a ref, like a reform blog, although I, I think he may be going to a conservative synagogue now. Um, but, um, but no, you are correct. Most of the blogs that I come across talking about reform Judaism are orthodox bloggers criticizing it, which I enjoy. I enjoy reading. Um, and um, um, so you are correct. Um, there was a guy, um, a very interesting uh, guy who wrote a book on Perkei Avot, um, who uh, 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 the Reform Movement has like a blog platform, and he put up a lot of blogs about it. They were very, very erudite. Um, but I think he stopped doing that because he didn't feel that the readership was really there. Um, and that is, of course, one of the dilemmas of liberal religion. As much as it may be make logical, rational sense to someone like myself, um, it lacks the compelling power of, of, of the more fundamental forms of religion, um, you know, which, which is stuff that I've talked about it at, in detail. Um, in, in earlier articles, I had an article in Modern Judaism about 10 years ago specifically on this topic, uh, that, you know, basically you have to have, uh, a, a strict theology in order to, uh, compel people to sacrifice for the, for the religion. 
and that when a religion is too liberal, too open, it may seem very pleasant, but it doesn't uh, it doesn't motivate uh, people emotionally to be willing to sacrifice. Whether that sacrifice is giving their life for that religious uh, approach or or just reading a book on the subway. I remember when, when I used to go to Reform temples on on Shabbat, like everyone of course would drive, and like half the parking lot would be filled with Mercedes Benz and you know, BMWs, and then everyone, of course, would drive away. But when I go to an Orthodox shul, we all walk there, and so there's much more of a sense that we're all, all in it together, and you don't have those, like, glaring differences. Like, in in my Orthodox shul, like, there are millionaires, but, you know, everyone will be invited to their, to their home. You know, there's much more of a sense that we're in it together. Right, and that's partly created by the um, the high barriers to entrance. So, um, as as I think, uh, you know, even we've spoken about um, the it's counterintuitive. You would think that higher barriers will chase people away, and they do to some degree. So, if I tell you of a choice of the Episcopalian Church, where you can go when you want and wear what you want. And do what you want, or the, you know, really fire and brimstone Southern, Southern, Southern Baptist Church where you have to go eight times a day and you must believe this, that, and the other, and you must do all this stuff. And if not, you're going to go to hell or they're going to throw you out of the congregation. You would think that most rational people would choose the Episcopalian Church, but, and that may be true that most will, but the ones that choose the Southern Sun Southern, Southern Baptist Church are the ones that are going, they have a high buy-in, and therefore once they buy into it, they're there, and they're with people who are also dedicated. And I've seen this problem at my, you know, my synagogues. I remember in Georgia, there was one very devoted woman, and she would run and do everything. But over the course of a number of years, she began to be um, disheartened because she saw most people didn't really care that much. And she was doing all this stuff and really sacrificing not just of her money but and of her time, but her um, input and uh, slowly, slowly, slowly you begin to feel taken advantage of. Whereas in a more fundamentalist environment, if you're missing and you're in the hospital, people will figure that out real quick and everybody will be at your bedside. And there's a much stronger sense of dedication and commitment. And that is really what we're talking about. This is a kind of a sociological construct. The beliefs don't matter. So you have certain of the new religions um, whose beliefs are just so patently r- ridiculous um, to, to someone like myself, for example, it doesn't make the slightest bit of difference because a religion really, it's just, uh, uh, it's just there to provide this sort of structure. So how does Reform Judaism build on, uh, on a liberal um, uh, edifice and so I argue that one of the things we need to do is to define our beliefs more clearly and raise those barriers, not up to orthodoxy, but in, 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 a, in significant ways. And uh, in Pennsylvania, um, there was, uh, I was, I spoke there uh, um, six, several weeks ago, and they had on Saturday night uh, three of the uh, larger pulpit rabbis um, uh, responded to my book, and then the senior rabbi of the synagogue I was speaking at was the moderator. So there were five of us there, and one of them was a very kind of, I guess, a classical reformer, um, but kind of a modern classical reformer in that very, you know, anything goes, and I don't tell anyone what to do, and you know, uh, I don't mind if they bring their pork chops to services, kind of a person, but a very nice guy. But when I said, you know, that we need to raise the belief system and make it make it stronger and start requiring more things and build a greater sense of unity and cohesion and obligation and commitment, 
and uh, uh, and we have to try to bring people along. But people who don't want to come along, um, you know, we we can't keep everyone in this big tent because if you have a big tent where you're bringing in all sorts of people, you have nothing because there's no there's no common goal, there's no common anything. So I, I so we ended up with this analogy of this boat. And I said, you know, if there's only two people rowing and 48 people sitting in the boat, you're not going to go very far. If you have 48 people rowing and two people not rowing, you'll go much further. So I said, well, what do you suggest we do with the people who won't row? I said, well, you try to nurture them, but eventually you throw them overboard. <laughs> and he looked at me so shocked. But you have to, you can't, it's better a smaller movement with a much greater sense of dedication and commitment and clear vision of what you believe than just to have numbers of people who are just uh, p- popping up every couple of years for who knows what and you that barely know where they are. I don't see the benefit of that. The other thing I noticed in my time in Reform Judaism is that it was increasingly the women were taking over, and it was the women who were showing up to temple, and <clears throat> the men were increasingly retreating to, to the sidelines. Um, and <clears throat> in particular, the lesbian women were really, uh, you know, moving forward and taking charge. Um, and, and so there seems to be uh, uh, an increasing feminization of Reform Judaism. Is that accurate? Yeah, that is that is also accurate, um, and uh, there has to be something done to create a more of a, a gender equality, a, a, a true gender equality. Uh, so here again, you have another example of how uh, something that on paper seems so so right and in reality produces certain sociological problems for a religious movement. Um, uh, I, I think we would all agree that that women deserve complete and total ritual and otherwise uh, e- equality in every facet of, of life, rel- religious and otherwise. Um, well, maybe the Orthodox don't agree with that, but 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 uh, most uh, most modern uh, Americans would agree to that. But we don't want to drive the men out, so we have to be much more deliberate about how we're organizing our congregations so that you don't end up with a completely uh, female-dominated um, uh, congregational environment. And that's super, super important. Um, how, how exactly you address that is, is, is something I haven't, I haven't written on, uh, but, um, but others have. And, um, um, you know, you clearly have to begin by realizing there's a problem. And uh, I think that if you start um, uh, focusing more on, on, on theology and what Reformed Jews and believes in and then and commitment, uh, I, I think that these are ideas and uh, concepts that that uh, uh, that appeal to men. Um, and, and I think that the religion has to have a more macho, macho element to it. Um, I, I think that what's happened is everything has to be, um, very soft and very, um, whatever you like, where it becomes almost a sin to set any limits or, uh, restrictions on anything. And that is, um, that, that is not only is that not going to appeal to many men, it's also not a recipe for a successful American religious movement. Uh, is there some like summer retreat where the the elite reform rabbis go, and that's um, kind of how they develop their their, their status? Um, you know. Is, is there like some kind of elite summer retreat uh, for Reformed Jews? Not, not that I know of. Okay. Uh, but uh, <laughs> but maybe it's just that I'm not part of that elite. So <laughs> um, there's, of course, the Central Council of American Rabbis Conference, which is held once a year. And uh, there are various committees of the CCR that, that 
uh, rabbis who are interested in being part of the leadership can uh, become uh, uh, volunteers in and become active in. And uh, CCR president is a um, is a voluntary position for two years, and rabbis who volunteered in various other positions eventually can be elected as president, which is considered a very big honor. Um, some of some of those presidents um, uh, use it um, to to push a particular theme. Uh, others um, in the last couple of years uh, have been very quiet and uh, don't seem to have had any particular um, uh, theme or, uh, or or approach that they that they were trying. They saw themselves just as you know a president of any organization, just trying to keep the organization running properly. So I think it depends. How would you evaluate the? Uh the the time that Rabbi Eric Yaffe uh, was in charge of the movement. That's a really hard question. I mean, um, uh, in in my in my previous book, American Reform Jews, and my I spoke very uh, effusively about his leadership. Um, um, it appeared that at the end there was increasing dissatisfaction. It's not exactly clear why or how much of this is due to particularly to Eric's uh, leadership. It's a very difficult uh, position to be in. Um, and uh, uh, what changes, if, if any, Rick Jacobs has made in orientation uh, since he's become pr uh, president of the Union for Reform Judaism is, is not entirely clear as of yet either. Um, so it's um, it's really hard to to evaluate uh, their uh, their leadership roles. Um, clearly, as someone who is not involved in actually running these organizations, uh, it's easy for me to say do this, do that, and I'm aware of that. Uh, the the ideas that I'm coming up, well, they I believe in them, and I think they sound they sound very. Um, uh, nice. Um, they would have uh, immediate uh, negative impacts uh, that I don't think that any president would be able to weather. Uh, so I think I do believe that in the long run for the movement that you really need to focus and you need to build a strong theology and you need to tell people who are not part of that approach to look elsewhere because a big tent is not going to get you where you want to go. On the other hand, I don't think that a president of the URJ can, can do that because, uh, it would, you know, they would be fired. You know, they, they simply could, you know, uh, I mean, it's, it comes back to the, to the, the issue of, of any, um, in organizational psychology. How do you bring change without bringing the wrath of the gods down upon you? <laughs> to mix religious metaphors here a little bit, but um, you, um, you you need to make radical change, but yet, um, but that even the slightest change is uh, going to uh, create uh, um, a tremendous amount of unhappiness that uh, will not allow you to to uh, to, to continue to uh, to make further changes, um, one of the uh, one of the the one of the attempts that Eric Yaffe made that was really I think indicative is that every biennial, which is every two years, the U Union for uh, Reform Judaism has a biennial where five or six thousand Reform Jewish leaders gather together. On, uh, some rabbis, but most of the lay leadership. And he, every two years, he would come up with, I think, two, two major ideas to push through for those two years. And uh, several, uh, 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 about four, four to six years before he retired, one of his two ideas for that biennial was to really put greater emphasis on the Saturday morning service. Because as you know, most Reform Jews attend Friday night, and Saturday mornings are very sparse. 
and in many larger synagogues it becomes um, almost entirely a bar mitzvah situation. So you have a Friday night service for some congregants. Saturday morning there's almost no congregants there, and there are maybe two or three hundred people that are guests of a bar mitzvah family who themselves probably never come. And uh, so, um, uh, I mean, I can't tell you how many times I've been at a synagogue on a Friday morning and I've met a bar mitzvah family coming in and out. And I'll say to them, I'm going to speak, I don't know, three, four, five times over the next three days. And I'll say to them as they're leaving, I'll say, oh, I'll see you at something over the next day or two. And they'll get, almost always give me this weird look, like, of course we're not going to see you. <laughs> we're just here to train for the bar mitzvah. We're not going to go to anything, you know, like a speech by you, even though we've met you and you seem like a nice guy. So there's just a disconnect there. Um, but um, when Eric came up with this, uh, um, with this initiative to emphasize Saturday morning services for the congregation, I thought that was exactly the right way to go. Um, but it, it was, it was one, he, it, it, he later told me that was one of his least successful initiatives. It was just not, you can't, so, so there's limits. Um, the best leader in the world can only move people where they want to move to, right? I mean, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's an extremely hard, hard situation. Uh, but it's a very critical one, and uh, uh, as uh, if you you know uh, uh, some of Eric's speeches, which are um, which are um, uh, which I've quoted in various places, he has expressed as of years ago a sense of of alarm that we need to move quickly before you know before we lose most of our uh, our, our our nominal followers. What do Reform Jews seek in their rabbi? Um, I think that most of all they're looking for someone uh, friendly and compassionate uh, with the emphasis on the uh, emotional uh, component. And uh, I think that um, that this this has shifted over the past 50 or 75 or 100 years, and that uh, restoring a more uh, intellectual model uh, would be, uh, I think, uh, certainly more to my liking. Um, but right now, I think it, it's 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 very much a pastoral a pastoral role. And, uh, and that, that, that lends itself very nicely to the women rabbis. Yeah. Well, another thing that struck me when I attended Re- Reform and Orthodox synagogues simultaneously, and, and there was one factor in moving me towards Orthodoxy, is that, is that the Reform congregants were much older and had fewer kids. And and so when I went to the Orthodox shuls, it was like teeming with children. You know, the the kids were just going wild. When I went to the Reform temples, it, the de- demographics were much older and they had much fewer kids. Is is that a uh, a general challenge in Reform Judaism? Yeah, but I think it, and I think it's uh, it's become something that the leadership is very aware of. And Rick Jacobs, to his credit, has been spending a lot of time trying to address that. So they have um, decided to put a lot more money into youth programming and youth movement programming. And also they're building specialty camps. Um, now, the, So the theory here is that there are parents who would like their children to get a... Um, uh, have a Jewish summer experience, which is, by the way, extraordinarily expensive, uh, even if it's subsidized. And um, um, but they also need to, or need to, or want to develop certain special skills. They may be very athletic, or very musical, or very scientific. And um, you know, this is an increasingly competitive uh, society, a competitive economy, and. Um, the parents and the children don't feel they can just, uh, you know, opt out of these other things for, for an entire summer. 
So um, the the URJ is try in the process of building uh, camps where you can do both. You can have science on a high level and the Jewish experience, uh, and that seems to be quite popular. Um, and there, there's one with sports, very high level sports and and Jewish experience, and uh, and they're they're planning a number of others. Uh, so so there are things that you can do. That does not, however, address my central concern, which is um, 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 building a, a coherent and cohesive Reform Jewish theology. Um, and this theological um, problem has been developing since at least the 1930s, but it is not um, endemic to to Reform Judaism itself. So, in you know, when Reform Judaism began developing. Um, and it's particularly in the 1830s, 1840s in Europe, and then in the 1870s, 1880s in the United States, uh, it was clear to the rabbinic leaders what Reform Judaism stood for. And that was a very non-traditional, non-observant kind of an approach, but it was clear, and there were beliefs, the mission of Israel, ethical monotheism, uh, and so forth that were 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 clear, and uh, there was a prayer book, the Union Prayer Book, um, which was coherent. So you you might pick it up and say, I don't believe in any of this, or this is not the way I would do it at all. But it made it made logical internal sense if that if you if you're following. Starting from the 1930s uh, at the Columbus platform. Um, Columbus Platform is, um, it was a statement by the Reform Rabbis in Ohio, uh, which is famous primarily because it began to move the Reform Movement from non-Zionism to Zionism. Uh, but, but, but what is not as often understood, it's also the, the platform that began to broaden the parameters of what, what was acceptable in reform theology. So whereas up to that point, people were saying, this is reform Judaism. And other people might say, this is reform Judaism, but they would argue because they all understood that reform Judaism had to have one approach. That approach had to have a certain internal and external consistency. Um, and then you would have a religion. And it would be a religion that you could embrace or not. Uh, but starting in the 1930s, there starts to be an acceptance of theological pluralism. Now, on one hand, that's a great thing, right? Because I believe a little this way, you believe a little that way, and we can all be Reformed Jews and have pluralism. What could be wrong with that? And I, in theory, love that idea, and I'm a big advocate of that idea in a, in a certain context. However, I think here you lose the ability to motivate people because once everything, almost everything is acceptable, you can no longer say that any one thing is true. And therefore, it all becomes a, a matter of, of options and then nothing is, nothing is, uh, is there. Nothing is, nothing is, um, absolute. Nothing is, um, um, is is um, a prerequisite to to commitment, and then you have no commitment, and people begin to float away because there's so many other options in in uh, in, a, in, a, in American life today. Now, let me give you another thing that I focus on in the new book, which is um, trying to figure out where the boundaries or borders of of Reform Judaism lie. And this is uh, this is um, this is becoming uh, more of an issue. Uh, I've been I've been thinking about this for quite a while. That religious syncretism will inevitably start to creep into Reform Judaism unless we take countermeasures. Uh, religious syncretism, of course, means that you're combining different religious traditions, beliefs, ideas uh, into one. And in an American open Postmodern society, that's perfectly legitimate, but not something that, that I want Reform Judaism to, 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 to go into. 
So um, if you looked at the brand new Pew study about American uh, Judaism, uh, you will see that that there is a, a blurring of religious lines, and uh, this this is uh, really not such a surprise, uh, but it, it 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 is a little bit to to the extent that that it seems to have uh, per, pervaded things. So so um, the three cases I talk about in my new book. Uh, New Reform Judaism, in terms of boundaries or borders, are Messianic Judaism, quote-unquote, Jews, and uh, Humanistic Judaism, or Secular Judaism, or whatever you call it. And so, but let's go right to the the, the most extreme example, which is, quote-unquote, Messianic Judaism, where you have, as you know, people who believe in some form of Jesus and say that they're committed to Judaism. Now, from a postmodern perspective, who am I to say that you can't mix and match religions, right? So you want to take a little from here, you want to take a little from there, you create your own group. Um, I mean, you have a right to do whatever you want. So many, many Jews, and particularly many Orthodox Jews, are furious at them because among other reasons, they feel that some of them are deliberately misrepresenting their their um, product, that they're they're trying to suggest or they're trying to say that this is Judaism, and then what they're really trying to do is convert people to evangelical Christianity. But uh, many of the Messianic Jews that I've met are sincere in that they really feel themselves to be Jewish. And they really believe in some form of Jesus. And so, therefore, they're not deliberately trying to mislead anyone. They believe what they're saying. And I think that makes quite a big difference. But either way, as a Reform rabbi, I would not accept any of these groups or any individual who has any belief in Jesus of any sort, whether as the Messiah, whether as part of the Trinity or God, anything that has Christian theological connections as, as acceptable within the parameters of Reformed Judaism. But the Pew study uh, uh, um, found that 32%, no, 34% of Jews that they polled said that they think that being Jewish is compatible with believing that Jesus is the Messiah. Now, 34%, I couldn't believe that number. And so, therefore, I thought, you know, I'm not a sociologist, and I have not analyzed their methodology at all. So I'm not, um, I'm not suggesting that I know anything about what, how, how good or bad a job they did. But it just seemed impossible. And so when I was in Philadelphia, I asked people a series of questions, including that one. Um, if um, if we were voting, if you were all on the membership committee of your synagogue right here, and you were asked to vote whether to admit the following people to membership, would you admit them? And I gave them these three choices: someone who believed, uh, who was a practicing Buddhist but also Jewish and did meditation, and somebody who was a atheist, said they didn't believe in God but wanted to be a member. And someone who said they believed that Jesus was the Messiah and that uh, wanted to be a member of synagogue. And the results I got for that very last question was about one-third, exactly, almost exactly the same as Pew. And this is among an older group in this, in this synagogue, which is seen as a more conservative reform synagogue in Philadelphia, which is a more conservative Jewish area. And the people, the 100 or 150 people who come to a scholar and residence programs who are older and more traditional. So even in that group, we now have one-third of Reformed Jews saying it's okay to bring in as a member someone who has some Jewish background, but also says, admits, that they believe that Jesus is the Messiah. So, um, so, so this is... Um, so, so the issue of boundaries or borders is becoming uh, uh, an important one 
in the reform movement because if there's no beliefs that are critical to being a reformed Jew, positive or negative things that we either do believe in or that we don't believe in, then uh, you're going to see very quickly that reform synagogues are going to have people who uh, have beliefs that traditionally were seen as completely antithetical to the basic principles of Judaism. Uh, so from the point of view of a scholar, looking at this, this is fascinating. From the point of view of a Reformed Jew, uh, it is uh, very worse. What percentage of uh, Reformed rabbis are atheists? Oh, guess? I don't know. What would you guess? Like in my experience, about 10%. I, I, it, that's a hard one. I'm not, I'm not a big guesser on these things. I, and, you know, of course, we'd have to define exactly what we meant by atheist. People who self-identify as atheist. Oh, I haven't heard a lot of that, no. But, uh, but I don't think that that, um, means that, that every reform rabbi has clear theological views. Um, so I'm not sure that that, I mean, even if there were almost none, I don't know that that means the movement's in great shape. And even if there was more, I don't think that would mean that the movement's in necessarily terrible shape. So I'm not sure that that would make that much difference. It's more, um, I think there's other factors uh, that, that are much more key um, than that particular one. Um, I think that, the vast majority of reform rabbis are maybe very flexible in their beliefs. And uh, that is, I think, born of necessity, that in order to be a successful pulpit rabbi, you have to be very flexible. On the other hand, I do not believe that that is necessarily good for the long range of uh, future of the movement. Um, uh, as you know, I'm speaking at Temple Emanuel in uh, Beverly Hills next week, and they asked me to talk about uh, on on Saturday morning. There's a very special lecture um, uh, on the topic of border patrol. What will be the boundaries of Reform Judaism 75 years from now? And uh, I guess the atheism comes into it is uh, will will it will it be okay to be an atheist? Uh, because clearly today it is okay. Um, when when I when I I said that in in uh, Pennsylvania that I thought that we needed to um, to uh, clarify our theological beliefs about God. One one gentleman uh, stood up and he said, I'm an atheist and I've been coming every week to synagogue here for 30 years. And I'm worried that your um, uh, your um, direction will write me out of the uh, of the future of, of my own synagogue. And we talked for a while. And what emerged is that he is not really an atheist so much as he just likes to be provocative. But what he means by atheism is that he doesn't believe in the uh, God that's portrayed in the book of Genesis. That God is up there doing all sorts of things, uh, creating and destroying stuff, um, and um, uh, all-powerful, all-knowing, somewhat capricious, sometimes even cruel, uh, quick to anger, you know, and so forth. And I said, I don't believe in that kind of God either. Uh, I believe in a more philosophic God. And so really you and I don't really see things that differently. It's just we phrase them differently because we're in different roles. I'm trying to present a, a, a lecture and you're trying to to, to just um, uh, make a little attention for yourself. And really, uh, our views are, 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 you know, 80% the same. And, uh, and so really you agree with me. So everyone laughed and he seemed very happy with the answer. And, and, uh, 
that was it. So I, I, I think that on one hand, uh, reform Judaism is going to have to find a place for the type of American Jew who's very um, questioning and skeptical and not uh, not quick to uh, to buy into things. Um, that is a hall, has been a hallmark of, of uh, a Jewish intellectual discourse for a long time, and particularly the Eastern European uh, um, intellectual, political, social traditions that many of today's Reform Jews are, are heirs to. Um, so I think there's room for there, there's room for for people who may, in defense, say I'm an atheist in the reform movement um, and I think we need to move them a little bit from that rigid stance of there's no God to a stance that says well the God in that's described in parts of the Torah is, is not a realistic depiction why do you think Jews are such a difficult people uh, <laughs> I don't know. If I'd known, if I'd known this, I might have become a, a, a veterinarian instead of a rabbi. Uh, it would have been uh, certainly dealing with, with with cows would have been a lot easier. Um, and uh, but um, I, I, I wonder about that because. Um, you, you, you know, I, I, I over the years I've had many friends who were clergy for the various Christian denominations and a little bit in some of the smaller uh, religions as well, and um, m most of them have had a much easier time in terms of being able to uh, to, to, to negotiate things. Uh, on the other hand. Uh, uh, you know, when you have, when you're a Catholic priest, for example, um, it comes with certain additional social restrictions, which I don't think that we, w either you or I, would enjoy in particular. And uh, you also have a very rigid um, um, political hierarchy that you have uh, less autonomy. Um, I can, uh, as a rabbi, I can make my own decisions. The Board of my synagogue can react in anger and fury and uh, try their best to, to fire me, but I can do it. A Catholic priest cannot. They have to report and take, you know, directives from uh, the bishop, the archbishop, and ultimately the pope. So they just can't change the liturgy. They can't, they, you know, they can't do a lot of things that I really enjoy um, doing and that makes being a reform rabbi so satisfying, if so frustrating. And this creativity, this flexibility is something you don't really have in orthodoxy as well. I mean, our new prayer book, which certainly has its, uh, uh, its drawbacks in terms of a, a clear theological approach, has so many beautiful readings. Uh, both the literal, the more literal translations on the right side of the page, as well as the more creative uh, renditions of those prayers on the left side of the page. And so you have a lot of liturgical choice, and that liturgical choice keeps everything really fresh and alive, uh, if people take it seriously. In Orthodox Judaism, you get status for being more religious than your neighbor. How do you get status in Reform Judaism? Um, we don't have the sort of a closed society that the Orthodox have where everyone in the community knows everyone else in the community. And so um, there is much less of an issue of status, which has its good points and its bad points. It has its bad points because, as you pointed out in a slightly different context earlier, many of the men in the synagogue were there originally not because they were so devout religiously, but it was a way to achieve status. So in previous generations, let's say in 1890s, being president of your synagogue did convey a great deal of 
of social status. Today, that's not the case. It becomes selfless devotion to a cause that sometimes seems um, much more trouble than it's worth. And so many people don't want to do it because it's lost the, the social benefit to, to, to all that work. Um, uh, on the other hand, um, there, there, there is its own satisfaction just knowing that you're doing something for the, for the good of Judaism. But there's not a lot of, of internal rules, of, of status awards. Um, and maybe in the 1950s, 1960s, um, being quote unquote successful and driving a Mercedes, um, conveyed status, but today so many people have that affluence that, that I don't think that that really, uh, does it either. So just to show up in a flashy car or be able to say you're making a lot of money, uh, or even to donate money, uh, isn't necessarily going to do all that much for your social status level. So that, that is part of the problem because as you know, religion is not separable from the other spheres of, of social uh, interaction. And for religion to be successful, it needs to motivate us not only theologically and emotionally, but, but also in, in, in terms of these uh, uh, social status uh, issues. Uh, so that, that is a, a, a very... Um, um, big challenge that we're going to face and that we may not be able to come up with a short-term solution to that. Now, historically, in American Reform Judaism, support for blacks has been seen as crucial to Jewish identity. Is that still true of Reform Judaism today? Well, I, I think the idea of justice and equality are things that we can all believe in. Uh, I, I, I don't think that uh, in today's world that reform Jews uh, need to or can give un unqualified support to any other group without looking at what the issue is and so forth. Um, but I think that, that any reform Jew will know that, uh, that you don't want to discriminate against other groups. You don't want to uh, perpetuate an unjust society. Uh, that we were slaves in Egypt and we need to be sensitive to others who have suffered, who've been persecuted, who've been discriminated against, whatever their color. Um, and uh, I think that's a very important value and continues to be an important value. How that manifests itself in actual uh, political policy is a little bit of a more complicated question. So as someone who participated in both Reform Judaism for many years and is now primarily Orthodox Judaism, there's a really profound difference in the way that Reform Jews and Orthodox Jews relate to blacks. Uh, Orthodox Jews are the most likely to live among them and near them because we're much more urban because we have to live within walking distance of a synagogue. You know, Reform Judaism is much more likely to be in a gated community or to be in the in the suburbs. Um, Orthodox Jews seem to see far fewer commonalities and have far fewer concerns about blacks, while civil rights for blacks seems much more viscerally important for for Reform Jews. So there is, you know, there's a there's a big difference there. And uh, what do you think? Well, I agree. And uh, uh, we don't really have any reform equivalent of Crown Heights or Williamsburg in Brooklyn or I don't know what the California um, 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 neighborhoods would be that would be similar. Uh, but you, you have them. There's a lot of Orthodox Jews, very Orthodox Jews, and uh, poor blacks living side by side. I'm sorry? Um, in New York, there are various right. neighborhoods where you have right. Orthodox Jews and poor blacks, including a lot of immigrants from the Caribbean and elsewhere living in the same neighborhoods. Yeah. Do you have those same sort of neighborhoods in California? Yeah. yeah. 
like right here in Pico Robertson, we're a few blocks away from black neighborhood. And so um, we there are 100 Orthodox synagogues within walking distance of where I live here in Pico Robertson. And if you go five blocks south of Pico Boulevard, it's it's a primarily black neighborhood. So we have also a lot of instances of blacks, you know, mugging uh, Orthodox Jews. Um, and so there's in the traditional Orthodox uh, communities that, that I go to, there's zero concern about civil rights for blacks, while in the reform temples that I go to, and, and with, among secular Jews in general, that's like, you know, that's like, for, for many, it's the primary aspect of their Jewish identity. Is well, it's right there in our prayer book. I think that uh, Reform Judaism is, is based on the belief that we are all made in the divine image of God and that we believe that our religion requires us to work for the betterment of society. So those are some of the principal beliefs that have withstood the test of time, and whereas some of the more theological beliefs that I'm trying to labor to rehabilitate have fallen the wayside, those have remained. So uh, God is a God of righteousness, uh, who wants us to, to to do what we can to make things better for everyone, and that that's part of the essence of of what it means when you say God is is holy. Uh, you know, to to quote from the Aleinu from the Union Prayer Book, which I mentioned earlier, it says, "O may all created in Thine image recognize that they are brethren." so that one in spirit and one in fellowship, they may be forever united before thee. And so now that's all very theoretical, of course, um, but I think that, that that's a, a very central plank in, in Reformed Jewish belief. So if a black wandered into a Reformed temple um, interested in converting to Judaism, what kind of reception would they likely get? Um... I think a very warm one. I certainly in Georgia we had uh, blacks who who came in and stayed. And uh, not only did I welcome them warmly, but uh, I think everybody did. Uh, now this is the uh, this is Albany, Georgia in the in the two thousands, which is a different place from Albany, Georgia, which you probably know was where Martin Luther King Jr. attempted to start the civil rights movement, it failed there, and then he moved on to Birmingham and other places. Um, but Albany, Georgia is where the civil rights movement was uh, was the very first attempt to launch it. So it's it's not just any place. And uh, in the, I'm sure in the 50s, things would have been very different um, because uh, Jews were a vulnerable minority who were most the shopkeepers and uh, had to uh, had to be very careful. And I, I, it's, this is a great topic because uh, I talk about this extensively in this new book, in in the, the chapter on on reform Jewish values. There's a whole section on social justice and what that might mean today. Um, but but I'm I'm aware that you know people of any color who have to live near poor people who um, who uh, of, of who, among whom there may be people uh, with uh, criminal dispositions um, are at, at risk so nobody is saying that that you have to be naive and and vulnerable and that um, you know I, I'm not arguing anything like that so has reform? Judaism proven that it can perpetuate itself, or is it in danger of dying out? Well, I don't. I don't think we're nearly at that point. Um, I think. Uh, I, I, I'm. I mean, what I'm trying to do here is to suggest uh, ways forward, and uh, I, I devote a lot of the book to. Uh, ideas about building um, a methodology uh, towards that process. 
So, uh, for example, as you are well aware, Reform Judaism has a reputation of being the movement where you don't observe. And so I have a, 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 a chapter devoted uh, to the question, to observe or not to observe, where I, I, I bring three um, examples of, of areas of observance, and I analyze each of them in terms of, of, of how, how the uh, area of observance developed and then explain what a reform approach to that m- might and could and should be. Uh, so I, I pick one area from each of three realms of life. So the first one is kashrut, um, and, um, and the second one is marriage and divorce. And the third one is, um, is Shabbat. So one is, uh, eating, one is Shabbat, which is, uh, holidays, you could say, and one is lifestyle, life cycle. And, uh, in each of these areas, I think that Reformed Jews can find great meaning in many, but not all of the traditional, uh, approaches and practices. And that uh, the, the 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 great task of re- American Reform Jews in the 21st century is to is to uh, engage with with uh, the various traditions and to develop a coherent uh, way forward where we can where we can say to people in this soundbite age uh, in in three four five sentences what does Reform Jews believe in. What does it stand for? What do you, what do you, what are you expected to do or not do? And why is it important? And we need to be able to answer those questions in a compelling way and in a succinct way. How much basis is there in Jewish history for forming and developing a community primarily based on theology? Well, I, I think um, I, I don't think that I'm arguing that 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 particular point. I think that you have to have theology. I'm not saying that it should be based primarily exclusively on theology in the absence of observance. Um, I think that that it's all part of what I see as the reclamation project of the 21st century. But I think it has to start with clarifying belief systems. Because and there's where I disagree with uh, Eric and Rick, uh, who wrote uh, the the afterward and the forward to the book. And so uh, you'll see they both disagree with me, but I, I think I'm right. Uh, and they say, uh, especially Eric says, we have to start with Jewish doing, get people doing things, and not we can't worry about what people believe because there's too much diversity and there's really no way to get any sort of uniformity that way. So let's just get people doing uh, doing Jewish things and move from there. Uh, but I don't I don't see that that will uh, lead us forward. I think there has to be a process of clarifying a belief system, and that belief system has to uh, be based on on God. And there's, there's not enough discussion about God, about the divine, about the, uh, about our relationship with God. And, um, to the point where historically, as I'm sure you've heard, uh, quote unquote, God talk has made Jews uncomfortable. But that is, uh, that is ridiculous because we are the ones who built, um, a close relationship with God. When other people's ancestors were still, uh, um, you know, cave people, and so uh, I'm being, uh, I'm, I'm trying to be funny here, but well, we certainly have been uh, engaged in a serious relation with God for for a long, long time, and to lose that at this point, I think, is is tragic. So I think theology or a relationship with God, to put it in a, a more p- pedestrian uh, terminology, is really, really important. 
Um, but it's also important to develop a new methodology to to developing how we're going to move forward in in terms of rich ritual or ceremony. I follow Charles Charles Liebman um, in the, in distinguishing between ritual and ceremony, uh, with ritual being defined as something that has to be done in a very particular manner. So when you read all these laws about the various sacrifices in the book of Leviticus, for example, that is ritual. You must do it this way and only this way. And if you do it that way, God will be pleased and it may even be efficacious, meaning that God may respond positively. But only if it's done exactly according to the uh, regulations, rules, requirements, etc. Ceremony, on the other hand, is something which is done primarily or exclusively to help nurture our spirituality. Therefore, it's not so important that it be done in an exact manner. So if it's a little bit easier for you to do it shorter or more in English or um, in the woods instead of in the synagogue or on a Sunday instead of a Friday or whatever, that is not what is so important. The point is, is the impact on people to have to have a ceremony which is spiritually meaningful and helps to people to open up their hearts emotionally to God and then to build a relationship with God and then to 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 to, to formalize that in terms of uh, a commitment to Judaism, the, the religion. And psychologists have found that you need some sort of a, an intense experience. Uh, um, I guess uh, Abraham Maslow talks about peak experiences and that these kinds of intense emotional um, uh, episodes can have a tremendous uh, impact on our ability to connect to things and to commit to things. And that if all we do is talk, 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 and people just kind of nod and then wander off, we haven't touched their hearts. And if we haven't touched their hearts, we haven't really accomplished anything.